session. We'd be ready to get started. So welcome everyone uh, to the very first Journalism Creators Summit. Um, we are super excited to have you all here. Um, uh, my name is Anita Silina and uh, I'm uh, glad to lead the team here at the school that does all these amazing things around entrepreneurial, executive, professional development, uh, education. And uh, my colleagues uh, did the main work of putting that summit together. So I'm just here to welcome you all in the beginning for a bit. Um, we have a, an amazing uh, and hopefully exciting day ahead of us uh, with all kinds of conversations um, and discussions on entrepreneurial journalism, on the creator economy and what it means for media. Um, and we have close to 400 people who signed up for this event. So I would say um, there is a certain demand to speak about uh, those topics. There is obviously a need to speak about um, uh, to speak about what the greater economy means for journalism and how it changes media entrepreneurship. So we are very excited um, for that. Um, I'll pass it on to my colleague Jeremy in a minute, but I just wanted to say um, that I want to thank our sponsor, the Facebook Journalism Project, or Meta Journalism Project um, uh, with the, the latest news um, and say thank you that they are sponsoring this event. This would not be possible uh, without their support. Um, and uh, I'll also say that uh, I peeked into the, the participant list before we, uh, before we started this very first panel of the day. Um, and we have people from so many different countries. So that's going to be really interesting to see. I, I spotted plen obviously plenty of colleagues from all over the US. I spotted uh, people from Germany, from Belgium, from uh, Austria, from Finland. I saw people from Gambia, uh, from Nigeria, people in Australia and Malaysia. If they are here live, I'm very proud of them because that time difference uh, is painful. Um, so super glad to have you all. Um, and uh, the day starts with our very first panel and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Jeremy Kaplan, um, to tell us a bit more about that panel. Thanks, Anita. It's exciting to be here. Um, welcome to everyone uh, joining us from all over the place. Um, I wanna just mention a few logistical things. Um, you see the chat, you're already adding to the chat. Um, please continue to do that. Um, it's great for people to share resources as well as any thoughts or reactions you have that makes the, the session and the day um, really exciting for everyone. Um, second is feel free to use the Q&A as we go along um, for the speakers um, to ask questions and we'll, we'll have Q&A time in between the presentations in this first session. So feel free to use that, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And um, also you can turn off or on the transcript if you'd like, if that's useful, you can show the subtitles or turn them off just by clicking that button. If you see that at the bottom of your screen, the, the transcript button. Um, we have three fantastic uh, presenters in this first session. We're going to get to them very, very shortly. Um, the first is Amanda McLaughlin, um, who is the CEO of Multitude. She's a podcaster. Uh, she also is a, a phenomenal business person um, in terms of thinking through how to actually make this kind of project sustainable uh, for Multitude and, and helping many others to do so as well. Um, next, we'll hear from Michael Rothman, who founded Fatherly and has shown that creating something from scratch um, can yield success and it took a while but it, it um, has led Michael to an understanding of, of a variety of ways to make projects sustainable which is one of the themes that we want to uh, emphasize today is that um, it's one thing to start a project it's another to to make it sustainable and uh, the presenters and the panels that you'll enjoy throughout the day hopefully will will share um, insights on that subject throughout finally we'll hear from Carlos Maza um, who is a YouTube video journalist who went from an organization to being independent. And he'll talk about how you actually do that in the video realm and manage to, uh, to find sustainability in creative ways. So we have three terrific presenters. Um, the format is gonna be a pretty simple one so they'll each have about 10 to 15 minutes to present, followed by some time for you to ask questions. And uh, after the third presenter, we'll wrap up this session and we will invite you to join us at the next session, um, which begins promptly at, at 12 noon, um, an hour from now. So, and then there's a sub, uh, subsequent session at 1 p.m. Uh, for some networking to meet one another, meet others at this uh, event. Um, we, we think there's a, a lot of really phenomenal people here that you'll like to get to know and, and get to chat with at least a little bit um, at the 1 p.m. session. The 2 p.m. session, we'll hear a kind of live case study with, uh, hosted by Ariel Zerulnik and a couple of really, really phenomenal ind independent journalists. And uh, at 3 p.m., we'll close with a session looking forward at the year ahead and what creators need and how we can be helpful to you and some themes from the day. So that's what's ahead. 
today, and that's what's ahead in this session. And without any further ado, we'll ask you one quick poll question. Um, we want to know about your um, creator um, projects, and, and um, we have a quick uh, poll question that we are launching right now on the screen. Um, and we want to know if you've already started something, if you're in the process of starting something or plan to in the near future, or maybe it's not for you and, and you're uh, uh, playing a different role in the ecosystem. And, and um, we'll give you a minute to respond to that and then we'll share the results. Okay, we've already got two thirds of you responded. I'll give you a few more seconds and then I will kick it right over to Amanda. Okay, so we've got almost 80%, there we are, 80% um, responded. So I'm going to close that poll and it looks like most of you are creators, right? Most of the folks in this room at this moment um, see yourself as a, as a creator. Um, and uh, if you see the results on the screen, it shows that 48% um, say you've already started something, 39% plan to start something, and just 13% say probably not. So a lot of creators in the room, a lot of great ideas. Feel free to share them in the chat, um, join the discussion throughout this session and throughout the day, and join us in, in uh, welcoming Amanda to, uh, to, uh, to kick us off with the with the um, with the first presentation here, Amanda, great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. I am so excited to uh, be with you all today. My name is Amanda McLaughlin, and I run a podcast studio and collective called Multitude. Um, and what Multitude is is uh, a couple of things. We are a beacon for independent podcasters and their communities. That is really our mission. We are both a collective, meaning that we support member podcasts with creative, technical, and business development services. And we also nurture creators with resources, training, and mentorship. Um, and I will give a link at the end, but we have dozens of articles and free recordings, um, audio and video of panels that we've done in the past and workshops um, to help support creators of all kinds, not just of podcasts, but of anybody who wants to make a sustainable living making stuff online. And I think relevant to today, I very much see Multitude as a small business and not a startup. Uh, and that may be uh, sort of uh, different uh, than many companies that you'll hear about in kind of the journalism and certainly the podcasting and audio spaces. But we are, we have no outside funding. We, you know, did a sort of uh, surprising thing of making a little bit of money and then investing it in the business and growing slowly over time. And we also have creator owned shows. So unlike a podcast network, we don't have any kind of centralized ownership or editorial control. We exist to empower creators to make their own choices and own their own businesses. And that is the business that we're in. So today I'm going to share with you five lessons that I've learned over the last five years um, of being a podcaster about creator led monetization. And this is something I see as sort of different to the creator economy in that very often the creator economy, we read about services and startups and VC funding hedge funds that are getting into the mix of trying to make a living off of creators. But what I'm interested in is how creators can lead the charge, lead industry wide change and really find a kind of sustainable future for themselves. So let's get it done in 10 minutes, a fun exercise for me. This is my framing quote for the day. The first talk you've ever been to with a lead quote from Modern Farmer, uh, let me know in the chat. If anyone beat me to it, I think I might be the first. So this is something that um, I, I come to very often thinking about how real farmers grow soil and not crops. What that means in practicality is that soil health is fundamental to growing healthy crops. It's not just about the plant that you grow, it's about the environment it grows in. And if you wanna change how your crops are, how nutritious they are, how successfully they grow, you don't start with the plant, you start with the soil that it's in. And that is very much how I approach monetization and just career sustainability, where the soil we're talking about here is community. And so the number one takeaway that I have had in the last five years of being a podcaster is that our biggest asset as creators is our audience. Uh, we are in as creators and here at Multitude in the community building business, not the content making business. Membership consists of 70%, over 70% of our show's revenue on average. Um, the rest is ad sales, merchandise, live shows, kind of all the other ways that a podcaster or an individual can make money online. And digital creators as a whole 
we exist and we are compelling and the creator economy is a thing because we make space for people to connect with themselves and with one another. Similarly, that means that specificity is a superpower and you are not seeking to kind of have the most general product out there for the most number of people to come to. You're seeking to be as specific as possible. The more specific you are, the stronger your appeal. And at Multitude, whenever we start developing a show with somebody new or do a consulting project or help others to make podcasts, we always start with why is it you? Why are you doing this? And why are you doing it now? And germane to audience growth, a question that helps you to seek new audience and grow your show and therefore your revenue is who will be really excited to learn that you exist? And if the answer is, I don't really think anybody's gonna be excited to learn we exist yet, that's a good data point for you that you're going to have to get more specific. Our second lesson for you today is that our earning power as creators is a function of two variables audience size divided by audience engagement. And when you want to raise your earning power as a creator, yes, you can absolutely grow your audience. That is a good way to get in front of more people and make it possible for you to make more revenue. But it's also crucial to increase your audience engagement. Talk to your audience, tell them what you need, tell them what's going on with your business, give them opportunities to support you directly. That's not just, you know, how do I pitch a sponsor? It's how do I launch a membership program? How do I make merch that I own? How do I invite my audience to be a part of what it is that I'm doing? And without these two variables, you can grow your audience as much as you like, but if you don't improve and focus on your engagement, your earning capacity is going to be limited. Thirdly, this may surprise you, I hope it encourages you, but your audience wants you to succeed. It is absolutely fundamental to spell out your mission. In supporting you, your audience must also feel that they are supporting something bigger. Maybe it's helping an independent creator make a living online. That was the reason why we saw actually a surge in Patreon support in the early months of the pandemic. Most of our advertisers for the year canceled. I'm sure many other creators out there experienced something similar. Our live shows dried up, our conferences and speaking fees were canceled and, and on hold, um, but our Patreon support actually increased even as people were dealing with changes to their income personally because our audience wants us to succeed. It's also crucial not to stand in your own way. You should launch with options for people to support you financially. I can't tell you the number of times that creators come to me and ask, okay, well, at what point am I allowed to launch a membership program? When am I allowed to ask for support? And the answer is, you're not in charge of what your work means to somebody else. You can't determine or control the value that your work has to somebody else. And if they want to show that support with money or with uh, any other kind of support, whether it's recommending the show to their friends or you know becoming a member of your community, that that's great. And it's not up to you to prove out that value or to demonstrate that you're worth it. You make your work, you give people an option to support you. And from there, you kind of have to let go. And finally, it's really important to follow through and give the audience the tools that they need to make that happen. Um, if you go into your podcast app and click on random podcasts and just pull up like a random episode or just a random show, whoever's thumbnail grabs your attention first. I am willing to bet that there are likely not going to be any links in the description of that podcast episode. Uh, for whatever reason, a lot of people just sort of treat it like a last ditch thing that they have to do before publishing an episode and they sort of write a little summary or a joke in the description and then they hit publish. And it's a real missed opportunity. It's really important to favor clarity over cuteness or brevity or making inside jokes, whether that's with the title of your project, the art, the other kinds of metadata, or just leaving links in your web website footer or your newsletter footer or your episode description. If people are moved to support you and do something that you're asking them to do in an episode, it's really essential that the tools are at their fingertips and really easy for them to use to follow through and actually make that happen for you. Fourth, it is crucial to find audiences where they are. Something that we always ask in approaching a audience growth exercise or a marketing exercise is where are your potential community members hanging out right now? They are going to be in digital and physical communities. They're going to be listening to other podcasts, reading newsletters, following people on Twitter, participating in Facebook groups and Discord forums. 
the people who your audience also love, I make a, a Dungeons and Dragons podcast, right? And all of the other Dungeons and Dragons podcasts that my audience listen to, those are my colleagues and not my competition. If we collaborate, my audience is so excited to see it. Any mega fan, anybody who's passionate about a subject, they want more and not less of the thing that really lights them up. So it's essential to think about how you can collaborate and add to your community, not how you can sort of divide up or steal other people's slices of the pie. And similarly, when you're in these spaces, see yourself as a citizen, not as a tourist. Listen before you speak, learn what's important to a community and a space before you get there. And in thinking about how you can broaden and kind of share the news about your show, ask how you can contribute to the space, not how you can use the space to advance your own message. And finally, point number five, platforms are not your friends. Uh, it is essential to diversify your platforms and services. Distrust all-in-one solutions. If a platform says that they can handle your podcast hosting and transcripts and monetization and memberships, run screaming for the hills. You have to own your means of production. Have your website, have your own domain name. Ensure before you sign up for any platform that your data is exportable, that if you need to move, you can. And if you aren't paying for a service, your audience is. Read data use and privacy policies because trust is really easy to lose and it's hard to regain. And like we learned in point number one, your audience is your main asset and it's crucial to maintain your relationship with them first and foremost. So those are my five lessons and I would love now to take some questions. Please keep them general so that others can benefit from these questions as well. Um, and go ahead and use that Q&A tab. I'll look out for questions now. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, really, really a valuable five key points. Um, and uh, it'd be great to, uh, to hear from folks with brief questions. Um, just keep your question to a sentence or two if you can and end it with a question mark if possible. And um, you can post it in the Q&A so that we can see them and pass them along to, um, to Amanda. And I will um, open one up um, for, for you, Amanda, as we're waiting for, for some to come in from folks. Um, for folks who are creating newsletters and other kinds of niche sites, um, local sites, what are some factors to consider when they're thinking about the question that I hear from a lot of folks, should I also have a podcast? Should I experiment with a podcast? What are a couple of considerations that they might want to keep in mind if that's a question they're thinking about? Yeah, it's a great question. And you should have a good reason to launch a podcast before you launch one. Um, I, I think a really important thing to keep in mind is if you have an existing audience or business, why should somebody who already knows who you are listen to the podcast? What's the value add? If you're simply kind of reading articles that they're already accessing in print, um, there needs to be a, you know, that's maybe not a sufficient reason um, to, to make a podcast. But on the other hand, it can be a really useful funnel to bring people in toward your regular business. So in that case, you might think about why would your podcast be appealing to people who don't know who you are already? How can you reach people that you could not reach with your physical organization or physical community, um, even radio stations? Uh, you know, often podcasts are a great opportunity to reach people outside of their broadcast area, um, which are really unique and a really good reason to start one. Um, so the idea is both if no one knows who I am, why are they invested? And for those who are already power users, you know, doing everything I'm asking them to doing, reading all of my stuff on all platforms, um, what does this add to them? Another question people have been asking a lot recently is about Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces and other kind of social audio platforms that have emerged recently. And, and uh, curious about what your thoughts are and the role they play in the kind of podcast ecosystem and how podcasters should think about or creators should think about using them or, or not. Totally. Um, I, I think that in podcasting specifically, the best place to find new audience members for your podcast are the audiences of other podcasts. Um, and so social media, we see largely as a tool to engage with your existing audience and less an audience acquisition mechanism. Um, it is, you know, it's difficult to kind of ask somebody to, you know, catch them on an Instagram story and motivate them all the way through the many laborious steps it takes to search for a podcast, open a new app, find it, subscribe, download the file, listen to the show, you know, there's a lot of steps and podcasting is a weird archaic technology built on RSS feeds. It's bizarre. Um, so in thinking about uh, Clubhouse, Twitter spaces, social media in general, it's a great way to engage with your existing audience. Um, you got to add value to them there, whether that's, you know, kind of increasing the experience of your show, lifting up audience contribution 
organizations, making connections, making colleagues, finding people to collaborate with, uh, complementing and raising up other work in your niche that you really appreciate. Um, but to focus on podcast growth, you got to collaborate with other podcasts um, and, you know, be guests, uh, do collaborations, do cross promotion, things like that. Great. Well, I think we I think we're going to um, let's move on to Michael. We may we may have other questions as as the um, session progresses in the Q and A. And if so, we will um, bring you back, uh, Amanda, to answer those as we go. Um, but this is a really a fantastic start with five very specific points. Um, I really particularly appreciate the point about community building rather than just content making. You know, I think that the content is certainly part of a lot of what we're doing, a lot of us um, who are creating, but the community building is ultimately uh, what's going to lead to sustainability, as you pointed out. So thank you for, for kicking us off with that, that point and, and several others. Um, and now let's move to, to Michael. And uh, Michael, in addition to being a founder of his own, a fatherly and growing and, and exiting that business, uh, also has been a keen observer of how people are generating revenue. And, and that's really a, a core point for us today is how can we actually make money aside from the creative aspect of this? And so Michael, thanks a, a ton for being here and for walking us through some of your thoughts on this. Uh, happy to be here. Let me just share my screen. Terrific. So this uh, presentation stems from an article that I wrote for Inc., which effectively takes a maximalist approach to monetization. Uh, many questions that I got from a lot of creators that I work with in the journalism space uh, had asked me about all the different tools and tactics uh, for monetization. And I realized that there wasn't a single comprehensive approach. Uh, so I decided to make one. But quick, uh, just about me, uh, I've been building media companies since high school. Uh, in college, I developed a custom publishing business. I went on to become the first employee at Thrillist, uh, co-founded Fatherly, uh, where we just exited about seven weeks ago. And all the while I've been investing in and advising, I'd say over about a, a dozen media companies uh, in a number of different spaces. Uh, been a big year, turned 40, got married, sold Fatherly, bought a home, became an adult. Uh, but effectively what I wanted to talk about today is you know, what I call the cheesecake factory menu approach to monetization, really just putting everything out on the table for creators uh, and showing different frameworks for how to make decisions about what monetization tactics might be right for you. So out of all the ways to monetize, uh, here are the seven overarching uh, categories that we'll dive into in a bit more detail. So starting with subscriptions, you know, the most basic for journalism creators, uh, four kind of categories, I would say, within that bundled, where you're partnering with other journalism creators, creating a uh, kind of a, a collective of subscriptions and offering incentives for other journalists uh, to join forces with you, usually by offering them maybe 20% of, uh, of the returns from new subscribers that they, that they offer every, that ever.2 is a good example of that. Everyone's familiar with individual substacks. Uh, the Guardian uh, has really focused on donations in addition to you know, a number of other tactics. Uh, and then endowments, being able to petition you know, large organizations, nonprofits, family offices to help support your journalism. I should also mention that all of these tactics, none of these tactics are mutually exclusive. And as a typical rule of thumb, most journalists or journalism creators will try to rely on a diversity of tactics. Uh, what I've typically seen is that most media companies will rely on three core monetization tactics above all else, usually subscriptions, advertising, affiliate revenue. Um, but it, uh, I'll present later a framework for how to decide which tactics or combination of tactics are, are best for you. Uh, so ads, there could be probably a three hour presentation on what advertising means. A lot of journalism creators will kind of poo poo ads. Uh, typically, um, if you're working with uh, advertisers that want to support your mission, I think the it's best not to start with advertising, but to approach advertising a bit opportunistically. Usually when you're building an audience, advertisers will take notice. If they're able to work within the framework of what you built, if they're able to help sponsor franchises that you've developed that provide value for your reader. That's usually a good opportunity to engage. Uh, the rebooting, uh, it, 
those who, you know, who might have been subscribing, Brian Morrissey, who uh, was the editor in chief of Digiday, has also started taking advertising and has also recognized that advertising can be a really powerful value add and not necessarily an interruptive detractor from the work that you're doing. Uh, commerce, and here are a number of flavors of commerce, just to briefly you know, talk through them, affiliate, uh, and in each of these examples, you'll see I put together some best in class examples, wire cutter, which is now part of the New York Times, product marketplace, uh, a la food 52, being able to curate products for your audience, uh, where you're drop shipping them so you're not actually taking on any inventory risk. Job listings, uh, there are a number of different flavors there where you're charging companies to post. Uh, clubs, New York Times Wine Club, you could work with a white label partner as opposed to starting a club yourself. Uh, and then custom product development. So Futurism, a company that focuses on tech and sci-fi actually developed their own product. They developed the Gravity Blanket uh, and sold it directly to their audience. And that was just one of many tactics in addition to advertising and, uh, and affiliate links that they relied on. And of course, if your audience really loves what you're doing, they would want to wear your t-shirt, your sweatshirt, uh, your hat. And so merchandising is also uh, a really good tactic under the commerce bucket. And here we have uh, you know, fees. Uh, so IP development, Pocket Watch is a uh, a children's programming company that just focuses on being an IP factory. So being able to sell uh, franchises that you're developing to, to platforms, uh, fact-checking, uh, actually working with platforms to provide fact-checking as a service. This is something that one of my uh, advisees, the Dispatch, uh, does with both Facebook and Google. And then many of you are familiar with live streamers. And so being able to offer more of a pay-as-you-go model uh, kind of like a, a tip jar approach. Selling to the enterprise, uh, an example of this, Thrive Global, this is Ariana Huffington's project where she's actually curating classes and workshops and selling those directly to large companies. Uh, Stratechery recently announced that their, you know, the CMS that they built for themselves is kind of worthy to sell to other people. Uh, so if you're a journalism creator who has spent a lot of time building out your own platform, it might be good enough for, uh, for other journalists uh, or other companies that want to create their own content. Politico Pro, uh, everyone here is probably familiar with Politico. Uh, the Pro product uh, ultimately you know, drove a kind of a lion's share of their revenue. And just being able to focus on research, selling that for a high ticket price, uh, another option, CB Insights, uh, after all the research that they've done as an organization over you know, 10 plus years, realized they're sitting on this incredibly valuable corpus of data uh, that they'll also sell to the enterprise. Uh, rights, uh, so authentic brands, just selling you know, rights and access to, uh, you know, to different creators, feeds, uh, being able to sell kind of access to uh, feeds to large corporates. Associated Press is an example of co-located content and credentialing, which is often ignored. Uh, you know, the U.S. News and World Report uh, being able to sell access to the credential that they offer to uh, colleges and universities, and this is another really great kind of high-margin opportunity. So that uh, that's a quick, quick look at 37 different tactics. Uh, I'm sure Jeremy will be generous and send the link to the original Inc. Magazine article, which provides all those tactics in more details. But really the key here is, well, how do you evaluate what's right for you? And so I thought this framework uh, would be particularly helpful. And so first identifying, is this tactic right for your community? Does it add value? Uh, we talked about ads and certain types of ads. Typically we associate with being interruptive, uh, that's probably not the best way to develop a great and lasting relationship with your audience. Um, complexity, is this very, very hard for you to do? Uh, if, you know, based on your experience, again, you might be a creator of one or a creator of uh, a few. And so is this within reach for you to develop uh, with the resources that you have? Likewise, how expensive is this to start up? 
um, harping back on advertising, you know, they could often be really expensive to hire a team and manage a team. Um, Food 52 didn't start with owning all this inventory to all the goods that they recommend. Uh, so there might be other ways to start, such as affiliate before graduating to, you know, um, more complex forms of commerce. How difficult is it to maintain? What are the scale requirements? Uh, is this something that you're doing for now, or is this a monetization tactic that could ultimately uh, grow with you as a company? And engagement requirements, and how difficult is it to get your audience continuous, continuously interested in this form of monetization for you as an organization? And so here's a helpful framework that I've that I've used. It's not particularly pretty in this form, but uh, in the version that we send over afterwards, I can provide a bit more detail, but this is usually the way you know, to look at each of the kind of individual tactics within subscriptions, ads, commerce, fee-for-service, et cetera, to determine what's right for the project that you're developing. And as I said, it's become a bit axiomatic uh, in media to have usually three different forms of monetization. Uh, and so as you evaluate the 37 different forms of monetization to figure out what's right for you, this is probably the most helpful framework that you can use uh, to determine what's best for now, realizing that you know, the monetization path that you choose now may evolve uh, with you as a company. And obviously a lot easier to say than to do. Uh, and so wishing everybody the best of luck. Uh, any questions? I'm sure there might be many. Thanks, Michael. Fantastic. Um, 37 different approaches um, in various categories. Um, uh, Ernesto is asking um, if you could go back in time, and this is uh, potentially for Amanda and Carlos uh, as well, um, uh, if you want to answer separately um, through, through the Q&A tab. Um, but, but Michael, um, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice before you started, what would you say? Um, well, it's probably le less, it less involves monetization and it's more about the team that I would build. I would say right now I'm at a point where I'm thinking about what to build next post fatherly. I think the first piece of advice is I would probably hire a chief of staff and a recruiter is the first two hires that I would make one chief of staff as a force multiplier for me, a recruiter to make sure that we're getting the best possible team that works, uh, that works well together early. From a monetization perspective, I'd say the best thing that I did with Fatherly is focus on monetization early. Uh, so we were prototyping the product for about a year before we launched publicly. And around that same time, I was shopping this to different advertisers and helping to prove product market fit, not just with consumers, with our prototype email newsletter, but also with the advertising community. And so once we actually launched and we had consumers and we had you know, a bit of a story that we we're willing to tell, we'd already preceded that story with advertisers. And so we were actually able to close one of our first national brands within 45 days of being able to launch publicly. And I think journalism creators will often, you know, when it comes to advertising, won't think about, you know, the, the sales cycle and how long it takes to educate an audience of, uh, of advertisers the way that it takes, you know, to build an audience of, um, of readers to your product. Um, there's a, another question here about your next gig. You wanna update people, you've had a big year, uh, Michael, on, on a variety of fronts. You wanna update people on what you're up to uh, now and next, now that you've built one thing, exited, what's, what's next? I've been spending a lot of time looking at Web3 technologies. I think what Mirror is doing, uh, is worth paying attention to, uh, but it's still very early there and still very proudly working with uh, our acquirer for fatherly uh, BDG. So no sudden moves at the moment. I think there might be some people out here who aren't familiar with Web3 or don't know much about Mirror or why that's significant or interesting. Could, could you just expand on that a little bit? Um, this is going to test my own knowledge as someone who's just kind of immersed myself in all the reading. This, this is the idea that you're, you know, I met Amanda earlier had kind of poo pooed uh, platforms, and I agree with that 100%. I think creators need to own a direct relationship with their audience. 
And Web3 is this idea that uh, creators are no longer disintermediated from their audience. They're able to offer uh, you know, direct access to their content, um, ownership uh, in the content that they're creating to their community. And so really cutting out the middleman, i.e. You know, Facebook, Google, uh, and it's a way of bringing more power back to creators, ultimately using blockchain technology. Um, but I think this is probably a discussion for a different panel. Okay, well, there's uh, uh, one quick question from Peter Green, an alum of our, one of our programs about what's your take on banner advertising? Lots of uh, niche sites and, and general sites have all kinds of banner ads now. What's your take on that? Uh, as, and, and then there's another question about uh, how did you approach the different monetization uh, uh, channels for Fatherly? Um, at what point did you uh, the commerce approach uh, become clear? Um, and I don't know how, if you want to just talk through how you thought thought about that at the time. I think we focused very early on on native advertising, so making sure that you know the look and feel of, of the ads, while clearly delineated, fit within you know the organizing design principles uh, of our newsletter and of our website. Um, We've certainly made exceptions, uh, but I think that's that's how we started. And so we wanted to make sure that you know the ads provided value. They looked like they agreed with the overall design aesthetic, uh, and that they were offering you know relevant uh, you know relevant messages to our audience. And with commerce, again, we started with affiliate commerce. It's you know it, so much of our. Uh, of our traffic is coming from evergreen SEO content. So, uh, so many of those articles relate to products to buy, which are also fairly evergreen in nature that uh, we're writing about, um, you know, men as fathers. And so, you know, the type of baby products don't necessarily change, you know, month to month, season to season. So, you know, a lot of the evergreen content that we have, which delivers well from an SEO perspective will also deliver well from an affiliate commerce perspective. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Great, um, that sounds great. I, I think this is a, a great follow-up to Amanda's talk in terms of you know, thinking through the specific monetization approaches and, and having some examples that you've pointed out is super helpful. Um, so thanks for providing that, that guidance and, and for also just providing some inspiration uh, for those of us building things to know that, you know, yes, you can make it work. Yes, there's a logical strategy you can follow. It may take some time. Um, and there may be some ups and downs, but you can you can actually uh, do quite well at this if you do it, if you do it thoughtfully and, and persistently over time as as you manage to do so. So thanks for leading the way on that and for for sharing with us some of your insights. And we'll turn now to Carlos, who brings us a, a very different area, um, moving to the video realm. And uh, speaking of of platforms, um, Carlos, you also have a, a unique, I think, perspective and an interesting one on that as well, um, which you can share with us, and, and, uh, and also a perspective of moving from a, a news organization to being independent, which is the situation facing a lot of people, a lot of journalists are thinking about, you know, is this the time to, to move? Should I move? Um, should I have moved? Um, when is the right time? Why, why to do it or not to do it? So thanks for being here. Excited to, to hear your thoughts. Thanks for having me. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Carlos. I'm a, a YouTube creator. Um, I, I started off working at a newsroom at a place called Box, making um, sort of short form political uh, essays, uh, video essays. Um, and I think at the beginning of 2020, went fully independent and just uh, transitioned to being a, a solo YouTube creator. I started off as a writer and became a writer, lighter, shooter, editor. Um, so it's a lot of uh, learning things on my own, but um, I'm sort of in a weird spot because um, though my livelihood depends on YouTube, I sort of made a commitment really early on to not make take any money from YouTube directly. Um, so I don't rely on YouTube's monetization pro program. Uh, I don't um, run any ads on my videos because my a lot of my work is um, about corporate media and, and corporate uh, interference in journalism. So I've never taken uh, any money for a video. I don't have any sponsorships. Um, it's kind of a weird spot to be in in this space because you're both financially very vulnerable and also can't really take the easy lifelines that uh, some of these platforms would give you. Um, so if I could just talk about my experience and um, I have a couple images to share, but uh, I, I'll say at the outset, 
I'm not an expert in this field um, because I'm just kind of learning it as I go along. So this is more of my lessons from my first two years as an independent creator than it is uh, some guidebook for how to do this correctly. Um, my goal when I started was not to make a ton of money, honestly. It was just to make enough money that I could make stuff that I was proud of and thought was cool uh, while also paying for insurance and paying for <laughs> rent. Um, so I've not been very aggressive in, in monetization. Uh, and I feel pretty happy with what I've done so far. Um, so I hope it's helpful, helpful to you. Um, just some intro stats. Uh, I have about 91,000 subscribers at this point on YouTube, um, about 15,000 followers on Instagram, I think like 160K over on Twitter. Um, so pretty decent, uh, I'd say mid-tier uh, YouTube range. Um, I am also unique in that I started YouTube from a pretty public platform. So I probably had a much easier start in terms of getting initial views and eyes than a totally independent creator would. Um, and I think that makes me uh, sort of unique. So I don't want you to feel like if your pathway doesn't look exactly like this, that that's something uh, on you because I think it is very, it's a very unusual pathway so far. Um, so I'll just share my screen and show you some uh, images um, or some things that I've, I've pulled up. So as you can see, uh, I launched in, I think, I think a month before the pandemic. So uh, maybe late, early February of 2020. Um, and you can see I was pretty unusually lucky and I had about 20,000 subscribers right off the bat who just, people recognized me from my um, work at Vox uh, and who were curious about me. I also had the New York Times write a story about me going independent. So I had a very unique, weird inroad into this world. Um, and then it's grown pretty steadily since. Uh, you probably see a pretty significant shift uh, around October of 2020. And that's because I went from publishing a video a month, which is my Vox space, to realizing that I was financially sustainable and wanting to make long form videos and taking five, six months to make a video, which is a very different way of producing things. Uh, YouTube and I think Patreon both reward much more uh, repeated publishing. YouTube specifically is algorithm rewards content creators who create, create things kind of constantly um, because it's people on the site. So if you are someone who wants to leave for a, a couple of months and make something long form, YouTube doesn't love you, obviously, because the longer you're gone, the less uh, ads they can sell to their audience. Um, but I got to a point I would say about October of last year where I felt happy with my Patreon and happy with my subscription base and decided I wanted to make something that was more meaningful to me. Um, so I've made two sort of like hour long uh, masterpieces in my mind uh, over the past year. And it hasn't been kind of like the gangbusters subscription drives that, I, that, that they were before, but I'm very happy with them. And for me, that's kind of a success. Uh, I will say <laughs> that the best video I've ever made uh, independent um, was this video that got 300, 60,000 views. Uh, and like I said, I don't monetize my videos. Um, so I don't get money from YouTube anyway. But YouTube lets me know that if I had monetized that, that video, which took me weeks of work in which I wrote, shot, edited, and published, would have made me $15, um, which I think is a kind of a brutal look at the way that YouTube, uh, I mean, exploits its creators and also how kind of not, not viable it is to survive just on YouTube views. It, it might work if you are the kind of person who publishes an hour long vlog every single day and are relying on just like a very bored audience to constantly be watching on autoplay your content uh, because then sort of over the aggregate over like several years, people will be watching enough of your videos every day that you'll have kind of like a, a regular income. But if you're trying to make kind of big, deeply researched, deeply edited pieces, YouTube is just not financially viable, um, I think for anybody. Um, I also say that uh, this is from YouTube's analytics, analytics page, which shows you sort of how people found your video and um, what search terms they used and what's forming better or not. Uh, you can see these jumps in, in the view count for this video. I have no idea where they come from. They're not based on any action on my part. I, I guess they are largely motivated by discrete changes in YouTube's algorithm or YouTube's you know, random decision to start promoting the video and people's recommended pages. If you wanna be a YouTube creator, I would say do not look at these analytics as much as possible. Um, it will drive you mad. It will make you try to see science where there is not science, and it will make you question your art a whole lot and make you a shittier creator because you're reacting to a mob that you cannot talk to. So if possible, try not to worry too much about YouTube's analytics page. It is not um, meant to help you. It's meant to drive you completely uh, mad. Um, I will say uh, that once I got a couple thousand subscribers, I got an invitation to be a part of YouTube's partner program, which is how they get you to agree to have ads run on your videos. Um, 
Though now I believe ever since, since I joined, they've changed their policy to make it so that even if you aren't a partner, they can still run ads on your videos, uh, just not pay you for it. Um, I took, I joined the partner program because it gives you some perks, like being able to choose the thumbnails for your videos, which is kind of a big deal. So it's kind of, this is sort of the unholy bargain I have with YouTube because I'm a partner, even though I don't really want to be, but this is, uh, you have to make an AdSense account when you do this and it's a whole um, deal and uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but it happens pretty early in, the, early in the subscriber and view count process. I thought it would be much, much later than it was. Um, most of my revenue comes from Patreon. Uh, so these are the Patreon tiers that I have. They're pretty basic. I don't offer something super ridiculous on my Patreon page. Uh, your name at the end of the video, if you're five or 10, you get to see some early access stuff, uh, some behind the scenes stuff. I publish my scripts with notes about what I worked on. Um, they are not super luxurious uh, uh, benefits. That being said, I'm always surprised by the number of people who are interested in donating at, at, at higher levels uh, because they just kind of kind of like you. Uh, I think what, what Amanda said is, is really um, profound and true. I view Patreon as this like service exchange platform where you need to be giving deliverables every week. And it is not that. When I give deliverables, they're like not really viewed that much. People don't really care that much. It is much more about people caring about your work and wanting to be invested in your process and just caring about you. Um, it's much friendlier and more welcoming space than I thought it would be. And it's taken a lot for me to sort of get used to it because it's not really what I'm, how I'm used to thinking about an audience, but um, it, it has been a lovely place. And if you can uh, make a Patreon uh, audience, I would, I would say do it. Um, here's an example of my donations growth. As you can see uh, in 2020, when I was publishing every month, pretty significant growth every month with every publish, um, which was great. Uh, at a, October, I stopped to make the long form video. Uh, this is sort of vulnerable, but you can see November, December, and January, I was working on this really big piece and was very anxious about the fact that I was not publishing anything. And so I kind of stopped talking to Patreon and you could see my donations kind of dropping at that point. In January, or sorry, in February, I went to my audience and said, hey, I've been working on this really big piece. I know I've been quiet for a while. Here's some previews. I promise I'm not gone. Thanks for sticking with me. And the bleeding stopped. And then when I did publish that piece, donations spiked, uh, which is a lesson in the value of telling an audience hey, I'm working on a big thing, just trust me. And them having some wall of trust for you um, was shocking to me. And uh, yeah, it's been really great. Uh, again, if you're really interested in um, money growth, this probably seems like a, a stagnant chart. For me, my goal was to kind of stabilize at an income that I was happy with and um, make really long form videos. So uh, this is a very happy chart for me. Uh, the other way that I make um, uh, money, though not really, is through, through merchandise. Um, I saw some uh, shirts that have like, I, I commissioned some artists to make merch with designs that I like based on the videos that I had made. It's not a huge deal for me. Um, every dollar that I make from merch, I donate to uh, a, a local nonprofit. So it's not, it's not like a big um, income thing, but I just wanted to show you some of the numbers behind it. Um, I partnered with a company called Represent that makes these websites for you and, and makes merch for you. Um, here was their initial uh, suggestion for the payout um, breakdown, how much money I get per, per unit, how much money they get per unit. Um, it's pretty brutal. Um, the, the merch is pretty expensive and uh, it's not a ton here. Um, I asked them to negotiate my cut down um, so that the actual merch would be less. So they end up making more on my merch than I do. Again, this is not a, primarily a, a profit motive for me. Um, I just wanted to have kind of like cool leftist merch out there, but I wanted to give you a sense of, of what it looks like. Uh, my other option for making merch was um, a company called DFTBA, Don't Forget to Be Awesome, uh, which is very ethical and, and does a really good job. The only problem is they require a certain number of orders before they begin shipping. And when I was started off, I was a, I was a smaller creator. And so I wasn't sure that I would get that many orders. And so it made more sense to go with represent, which doesn't really care about um, how many orders you make. But I just wanna give you a sense of, of what it looks like. You're not making the majority of the money um, from those merch sales. Uh, and I, merch is not a huge part of my <laughs> anti-corporate brand anyway. <laughs> so it's, it's not a, a huge um, draw for me. Um, and the two other things I'll say, because I know we're reaching the end of time is, um, sponsorships and, uh, and alternative um, funding mechanisms. So I obviously don't take sponsorships for any of my videos, but I do still get emails about sponsorships. Uh, they're usually very funny and weird. I get a lot of people, emails from people who obviously have never seen my content and don't know that I'm a Marxist trying to, <laughs> trying to destroy capitalism. So I get uh, people asking me to do ads for weird things. The most recent one I got, which is pretty cool actually, was this weird invitation to the New York Glass Museum <laughs> to like come check it out and do some silly Instagram posts. I didn't take it, but it's probably the closest I've ever been to taking uh, some kind of perk for being a creator because it was it seemed like it'd be a fun thing to do for my friends. But I didn't actually do it. Um, 
there, there will be people when you start independently and start getting an audience who um, reach out to you and offer services. Like if you give us a cut of your ads, uh, we'll help promote your videos. I've always said no to those. They've always, always given me kind of like skeezy agent vibes. Um, so I can't test um, testify to how useful those are. Uh, but if you start getting a lot of views, you will get a lot of really weird ads um, with specific requests. And uh, there's been a lot of people who agreed to run ads for things on their channels on YouTube and then had to later apologize because those things are deeply unethical um, or just bad products. So I would just say be wary of those things or if you can avoid it altogether like I do. The other um, option is Super Chat, which if you live stream on YouTube, people you can turn on a thing called Super Chat where YouTube people viewers just donate a couple of bucks to you directly. Um, I streamed myself playing video games a couple of days after publishing a big video and people were trying to do it and I turned it off because I didn't want it to happen. I, I'm not a streamer, it's not my thing and I don't want to have my income based on that. But if you are someone who's interested in more like constant immediate engagement, sort of like Twitch, YouTube does have a super chat function that is not super reliable, but let people give you money directly while you talk to them, which for some of you um, might be more your speed. So that's an option too. Um, but those are the sort of, that's my experience with uh, um, revenue making. It's like I said, it's pretty, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on monetization because my goal is just like to not starve and make cool shit. Uh, and if you have a decent Patreon audience, it is actually um, much less hustly and much more trust-based and organic than I imagined it to be. And I think a lot of what Amanda said about um, having your audience under know you and feel like they're invested in your in your product and um, being honest about what you're trying to make and what motivates you uh, has been surprisingly to me, a really reliable way to build and maintain an audience. Uh, Jeremy, I'll hand it back. Thanks, Carlos, fantastic. Um, we are getting ready to round up this session because we've got a fantastic session coming up and we want to make sure everyone can get there. Um, but uh, there's a question about, uh, and maybe we can make this a quick answer about moving from writing to video. Um, somebody's, uh, Lynn Brown is wondering, you know, teaching myself the skills for video feels so overwhelming. Is this something you already have to be an expert at or do you feel like this is something learnable, Carlos, for people, for journalists? Uh, it, it's learnable. I mean, I, I learned it. I And honestly, I used a, a Linda course, which is like an online, uh, like a, a video course that took me maybe a, a couple hours of, of watching. The basic premiere tools are pretty easy. I would say the bigger adjustment is learning how to write for video. Writing for writing is a different style of, of a different voice of writing for video where you're writing to visuals. Um, so that took me a lot more work and like getting, understanding how a YouTube audience wants to listen to you requires more work, but the actual logistics of putting images on screen and making transitions is surprisingly intuitive once you get the, the basics down. And it honestly took me a Linda course and having my buddy who shoots teach me how to hit start on a camera. And that was it. I would say I've gotten much better since I started, but the core mechanics of it, it took me maybe a couple of weeks to learn and then it was over. Great, that's that's really encouraging to hear. Um, I think for people who assume they have to invest their, their you know, years of, of time and, and effort into it, um, into, into the beginning of it. Um, somebody's wondering about your, your gear. What, what camera do you have? Uh, somebody asked. Uh, oh God, you're asking, you're asking the wrong person. It's the camera that my, my best friend told me to buy. Uh, it's a Sony A A seven hundred. Is that that sound right? It's probably not right. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a Sony. <laughs> okay, well, uh, and I've used the same one the entire time. But okay, well, I, I know who answered, I, know, I know who asked the question, so we can we can get back to them if need be. Yeah, ha happy to give you the, to look through my um, Google email and find but what it was when I said, please help me buy camera to my best friend. It's, it's also a great point though, Carlos, which is that, you know, it's not really about the tech or the gear. Like you, you could probably, knowing the work that you do and the passion you put into it, like you could probably make it on your phone and or any other camera and it would be, you know, probably equally impactful and and uh, and it's really the, the community as Amanda put it and the the strategy and the approach as Michael put it and, and the kind of passion and and um, community building that you you described. Um, so yeah, thanks yeah. thanks so much for that. Um, uh, I want to just say a few words in summary here, um, just in, in concluding this session. Um, some terrific insights from from all three presenters. Um, from from Amanda, this notion of of um, you know starting with the soil, thinking about the community as the basis. We're not content creators as much as we're community builders thinking of our audience as our partners, our assets, thinking of others in the ecosystem as collaborators, not competitors, um, thinking about the um, fact that audiences want us to succeed and, and to helping us think about finding them where they are um, and, and, and considering where we want to put our content, whether on platforms or on other places. 
Um, Michael walking us through subscriptions, ads, commerce, fee for service, um, selling to companies, um, experiences, so many different ways of thinking about monetization beyond just the, you know, hoping and praying. Um, so lots of really great tactics. And, and then Carlos um, showing us how um, you actually make it work on YouTube, um, even without relying on the monetization built into the platform, really just building community through Patreon and, and, and through quality work, ultimately, as you put it, um, it's, it's really the, 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 uh, uh, the, or as you've shown it, I guess, is the quality of your work that's really built the, built the audience. So thanks to all three of you for terrific presentations. Um, I, I would love to sit and chat longer um, and, and I have so much to, to, to learn from all three of you and so um, many of us do. Um, we're gonna turn the community over to our next session though, um, which will include some voices from panels and others. So it'll be interesting to hear their view on some of these topics. Um, and these are organizations that are supporting the ecosystem in various different ways um, from various different angles. So a lot of players are now joining and, and helping build the ecosystem. So we're gonna hear from them about what they're doing, how uh, creators can benefit from them, um, what the different roles are in the ecosystem, how the ecosystem is changing. So um, you should see the link in the uh, chat um, to join us. And it's also in the, the document that you have with the overall agenda, the, the event map for today. So we'll see everyone over on the next Zoom link. And again, once more, thank you um, so much to Amanda, Michael, and Carlos for terrific uh, presentations and for sharing your insights and for doing what you do to, uh, to inspire everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you over there. See you at the next panel.